Good morning and welcome to Armanino's webinar, The Cost of Ignoring the New Revenue Recognition Standards. So we wanted just to uh, review for you how to use your webinar pane. Again, it's in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have questions for our presenters as we go through uh, the webinar today, please type in that question and hit the send button. And we will an answer those questions as time permits at the end of the webinar. Additionally, you can modify your audio settings. When you entered the webinar, uh, the software picked the um, audio setting for you, but if you'd like to switch over to computer audio or phone call, um, then just go ahead and click that Choose an Audio Option button, and you can manually select your option. Now here's an important reminder. To qualify for California Continuing Education, you must be using a personal computer, no smartphones, and log in with your own information and unique URL. You must be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. You've got to actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and complete our evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. And just to remind everyone, you will receive a copy of the slides and a link to the recording within two days after today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters. First, we've got John, John Dunnikin. He's a partner in our financial advisory services. John's got over 30 years of financial executive operations and consulting experience. He's walked in a lot of your shoes. He's held positions as the CFO, VP of Finance, Treasurer, Controller, and Director of Operations. And he, his background includes extensive management, financial and operations skills, such as process reengineering, information systems, and cost reduction programs. Our second presenter today is Ricardo Martinez. He has more than 15 years of accounting and finance experience. He's held positions with KPMG's audit group and their global methodology department. He's a member of the AICPA, CalCPA, and Provisors, and he's a proud graduate of Santa Clara University. During today's webinar, you will learn how to examine a prototype revenue recognition gap assessment You'll identify your organization's kind of holistic risks from the departmental level all the way to the valuation of the entire company. You'll be able to evaluate the preparedness of your internal team members to handle the new requirements and impacts of the new regulations. And you'll get tips for working with an auditor to streamline audits moving forward with the new revenue recognition standards. And our webinar today is going to cover the basics of ASU number 2014-09, the costs, representative revenue recognition challenges, and how to account for them, the AICPA's learning and implementation plan, and then a revenue recognition gap assessment. And with that, we're going to start you off with a polling question. Make sure everybody's with us and awake this morning. Okay, and so the first question is, how prepared are you for the new revenue recognition rules? Is it A, we're just starting to think about it, B, we've already done a gap assessment, C, we have a team in place, D, we have a software solution in place, and E, we have a transition strategy. So we're going to give everyone about 30 seconds to answer that question. We want to make sure that you get that continuing education credit. So. Um, Please select the, uh, the answer that best suits your solution. It may be that you have both a team and a software solution in place, but just uh, check the ones that apply for us. Okay, and with that, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. So John and Ricardo, it looks like the most popular answer here is that the audience is just trying to think about their revenue recognition transition planning. Yeah, I think that's, you know, this is... Uh pretty indicative of what we're seeing just uh, around various webinars and conferences and stuff like that where people are, are just starting to think about it now as we start to approach the timeline for um, switching over to the new rules uh, based on the, uh, the, the ASU which extended the, the uh, implementation date. So not surprising I, I would think. What about you John? No, I think, it's, I think it is very consistent with what we're seeing with many of our clients. It is, it is definitely time to start thinking about it. Because uh, we are, you're going to very quickly run out of time to uh, make all the changes you need to make. With you know, for public companies, it, it's 
the effective date is uh, 2018, private companies is 19, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but it could be a very long process depending on, on, the, on the company, what you, how your company operates and some of the impacts. So it's, it's definitely time to start thinking about it and it's, it's good that you're here. Uh, we have so many people uh, signed up to listen to us this morning and, and begin to think about it because it is, it is definitely time to start rolling, I think. Yeah, I think one of the more important facts, too, as we're switching slides here is to think about um, uh, what we'll cover today is some of the some of the details that are that are kind of I don't want to call them hidden, but but uh, some of the subtle nuances of the new standard that people should consider as they're evaluating their revenue recognition process. All right, so important dates. Uh, as we talked about, the original standard was finalized in um, May of 2014, so now we have ASC 606. Uh, the FASB delayed implementation uh, of the standard by a year, so John was talking about the 2018 for public companies and 2019 for, uh, for, for private companies. Uh, and then since then, there's been a, a series of publications and, and standards uh, clarifications regarding the, um, the ASU, or the ASC, I should say. And uh, the, to me, I find this actually, this is one of the interesting parts, even though this is supposed to be principles-based, um, we're already seeing a lot of ASUs that are uh, being issued, and, and I would expect there to be a lot more that come out. Uh, ASU 2016-08 provides uh, guidance and clarification on assessing principle versus age and considerations particularly with respect to the gaming industry and gift cards. ASU 2016-10 uh, introduces the concept of materiality in the context of the contract. Uh, also speaks to the policy election regarding shipping and handling fees um, and additional licensing implementation guidance is provided as well. And then ASU 2016-12 uh, uh, discusses collectability and the presentation of sales taxes too, as well as non-cash consideration, contract modifications, and completed contracts. So uh, again, even though as we as we start off with a very broad scope related to um, this this principles-based standard, uh, I think we're going to start to see a little bit more clarification as it relates to U.S. GAAP uh, and providing additional. Uh, probably industry-specific guidance. So th this is something that's going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years. So as we already mentioned, the important dates related to the implementation go live for public companies is essentially January uh, 2018, and then for private companies, it's uh, 2019. So again, although there is some time, and it is nice that everybody's starting to as we saw in the initial polling question, just starting to, to think about it, I think was the, the dominant answer there. Um, it is something that, as John mentioned before, uh, companies need to understand their processes because it's not just finance accounting that's affected. And we'll talk about that in, in a couple of the later slides. But um, certainly one of the things that, uh, that we encourage uh, all the participants to do is, is uh, work to understand the revenue process uh, and understand who is affected uh, by those, uh, by, by the changes to the standard. Okay, so from the overall kind of top-down approach, um, one of the key ideas or principles of the standard is that an entity should recognize revenue to depict the transfer of goods or services to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services, and that's that's straight from ASC 606. So with that, uh, the standard explains that to achieve the core principle, the entity should take these uh, the the five following steps uh, in order to achieve that that goal. And step one is to identify the contract with a customer. Step two, identify performance obligations in the contract. Step three, determine the transaction price. Step four, allocate the transaction price, and then step five, recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfies a performance obligation. So these are going to be kind of our core principles that we'll be following as we um, as we evaluate revenue recognition. Uh, again, there's 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 some comparisons to the current standard uh, 
Uh, but for the most part, they really try to take kind of a fresh look approach, although some concepts do carry over into, um, into this new standard. So we'll talk about those also in a couple of slides. All right, exceptions to the rules. So the transactions within the scope, um, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the following transactions on the page actually remain within the scope of, of industry-specific guidance. And so that is insurance contracts, leases, which I'm sure is the next big one that everybody's uh, following as well, financial instruments, guarantees, and non-monetary exchanges as well are the, the ones that are essentially scoped out of 606. And the Transition Research Group resource group uh, has included several agenda items that they're focusing on over the next couple of years, and they, they plan on issuing uh, some guidance that hopefully will come out in early 2017 uh, with respect to contract modifications, loan servicing agreements, transfer of control, and then accounting for customer options and incentives. So um, this is certainly something to keep an eye on and, and as, as additional clarification comes about and certainly something that, that I, we'd encourage you to work with uh, your auditors or your service providers to understand how these might affect your company. So we've published a couple of articles and white papers which are available from the Armenino website so feel free to download those. If you do have any questions uh, we're certainly available to answer those or you can, you can uh, ask any of the questions um, during this webinar. Great, thank you Ricardo, and we're going to ask you all uh, the second polling question here, so if you'll hold on as that comes up. All right, so this is, a, we're hoping this is an easy one for the audience. So when are the new rules effective for private companies? It's 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, or you're not sure? Um, so we want to make sure that you are getting ready for that timeline and uh, are aware if you're a private company. And it looks like we've gotten the majority of the attendees have voted. So we're going to go ahead and uh, close that poll. It also looks like the majority got the answer correct. That's right. All right. So I, uh, I did my job here. So that's good. Uh, 2019, yes, for, uh, for private companies. They do have the, the um, ability to early adopt, but no earlier than than uh, the effective date for public companies. So that is something that to, to, to consider. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. We're going to turn it over to John. Okay. So we want to, by, by way of illustration of some of the, uh, talk about some of the changes and the impacts of the, of the new standards, we're going to look at some examples, um, kind of intentionally simplified uh, for the webinar purposes, but the objective is to really kind of illustrate how, how the new standards change some of the guidance and how some kind of typical transactions uh, might, might be impacted uh, by the new standard. So one, one of the key points, though, uh, to talk about up front, I want to make sure that everybody understands, is that the total revenue on a contract to be recognized will not change under the new standard. So if it's a if under the old standard it was a hundred thousand dollar contract, under the new standard it'll be a hundred thousand dollar contract. Um, however, the, the, the big impact will be the timing of that change could change. The timing of the recognition could change substantially, and that obviously will have a lot of impacts on on the company, on um, how the how your investors, if you're a private company, uh, look at your company, and more importantly, if you're a public company. Um, how the street might evaluate your company. We'll talk a little bit about that a little later on. Uh, but if the timing of revenue changes, particularly in the transition periods, um, that could have a significant impact on, on, the, on the street's evaluation of the company and of your investor's evaluation of the company. Uh, obviously, it also could have a significant impact if you have bank uh, covenants that you need to maintain. Um, it could impact those as well. So there are a lot of potential impacts due to the timing uh, but the, at least the good news is that the total amount of revenue won't change. Uh, one of the other big changes is that uh, the new standards now require you to evaluate or estimate the impact of variable consideration. Um, in, in the, in, under the old standard, uh, if, if consideration was variable, it could change. By and large, it meant that the revenue was more often than not was deferred um, until, until the uncertainties were resolved. 
Um, under the new standards, uh, things like sales incentives, discounts, warranties, um, uh, now generally are recognized up front at the estimate of what those, what those values are. And we'll look at some examples of that. Uh, but that's a, that could be a substantial change for a lot of companies, especially um, for a lot of companies in technology space, uh, where, where, a lot of, where I know a lot of the, uh, the folks on this webinar are, are from those spaces in, in technology, biotech, uh, software, uh, SaaS companies, things like that, where, where the, uh, the, the, a lot of the variable considerations uh, do exist. So that those timings can also change fairly substantially. Okay, looking at a few uh, a few examples, we're gonna we're gonna run through here, and and the first example again fairly simplified is you know a vendor sells a uh, perpetual license to a software with two years of support, um, upgrades are if and when available. The uh, the sales price of the of the contract is ten thousand dollars, and the the vendor does not have uh, VSOE, which is the which is the old standard. Uh, under which revenue is recognized. Um, the if and when available is one of the interesting things. My, back in my days as CFO, um, I always liked the if and when available because the nice thing about it was I could just ignore it. Um, if, if upgrades or changes were only if and when available, you didn't need to account for it. You could just, just pretend it didn't exist and just move on. Uh, the new standard very specifically calls out if and when available. They kind of figured out that a whole lot of us were, were ignoring that. Uh, so you now very specifically must evaluate the if and when available and, and, and put a value on that. And that's a, a new standard that is, that is called out. Um, so, so if you have all those contracts, that you now need to evaluate that. And that's going to be particularly important in the transition because when you, as, as you transition to the new standard, if you have contracts today that have if and when available and you're ignoring that, ignoring that provision, which under the current standards you do, um, when you do the transition, you're going to need to restate all of those contracts and account for that if and when available and put, it, put, a, valuation, put a value on that. And that could have some very substantial impacts on, on how things recognize. So let's take a look at how, at how, this, how this might play out. Um, on the right is uh, 605, how this contract would be accounted for in my example. Um, you've got a license for $10,000 um, with 24 months of support. If you don't have VSOE, essentially the whole contract gets, is deferred and recognized over the, over the 24 months. So you end up with this nice uh, amortized revenue over 24 months. It's for, kind of very easy to track and report. Under the new standard, uh, the treatment becomes very, very different. Um, of course, cash is still cash, so that's always, that's always true. But you need to evaluate each of the each of the other three major components of the contract and assign a value to those. Um, obviously, the value assigned to each of these is going to be very um, uh, fact and circumstances specific to your own company and to your own company's history. But we'll assume, for for purposes of example here, that we've determined that the license revenue, the license portion of the revenue is three thousand dollars, and that gets recognized up front. Um, support is still amortized over the, over the 24 months in which it's offered, um, and we're going to, based on the company's history, the, the cost of the uh, providing the support, uh, maybe, the, maybe the value that it's sold out separately, essentially best estimate of selling price is what we're using, uh, that gets amortized over 24 months. Uh, now, though, we really need to have this if and when available for the upgrades needs to be evaluated. Um, and, and this is the, the really the big, one of the other big changes here, as I said. Uh, we now need to carve that out and recognize that um, the upgrades, as those upgrades are delivered. And we're going to assume that, you know, based on the company, uh, determine the value of that is $2,000. Now, as I said, that's going to be based, based on the facts and circumstances of the company. If the company has a history of doing, you know, upgrades once a year or twice a year, um, you, you may recognize that at, at one time. Um, it is possible you may still recognize it over 24 months if, if upgrades are done, you know, kind of very slowly every month you're constantly doing this, these upgrades, you may still recognize it over 24 months. Uh, the key point is that under the new standard, that has to be carved out and evaluated separately. And that, that's a very important consideration, whereas before uh, you didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what, this was an interesting um, 
a scenario too. When John and I actually presented at a um, at a conference recently, uh, and we were going over this slide. Uh, to John's point, there were there was differing views even within the um, uh, within the group, um, and I think that's one of the important things to highlight as part of this new standard. Again, it's not prescriptive like our current standard, but it's more principles based. So really, I think one of the interesting things that's going to be a byproduct of the new standard is the fact that you can take differing views even within an industry uh, and still be right uh, because it is principles based. Um, but again, my, my opinion is that uh, as we get down the road, I think we, we, we come back to more of a prescriptive base through the ASUs and clarifications and all that. So I think the pendulum will swing one way, more principles based initially, and then I think we back get back to a prescriptive base in a couple of years once we um, you know, kind of see diversity in practice. But initially, I mean, that was that was one of the great points that we saw from that conference was was two differing views, and theoretically, both were right. Yeah, it was interesting in that in that seminar because we got we did get into a bit of a uh, kind of a, a friendly debate among mm -hmm. uh, the various participants as, as they each looked at it differently and how their own company might evaluate that. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. You're right. I think over time, with what the SEC is going to say, because um, the SEC hates when you have similar companies doing different things. Yeah. That, that really, really bugs the heck out of them. Um, the ICP, and of course, you know, the, the big four, and they always have a big influence through their very large public companies on, on kind of how these things get, get sorted out. So it will be a very interesting evaluation over time, uh, but that's going to be one of the more interesting things to see how that plays out. Uh, the, second, the second example um, I want to put out here, this is something we run into with a lot of our companies, um, not so much with established companies, because established companies don't do this, but new companies, uh, companies just starting out, do this all the time, which is when they're essentially you have a, you're selling a software license uh, plus upgrades that are on the roadmap. Um, you know, established companies, as like I said, you know, typically don't, would never do that, but new companies that are just trying to start out, they're trying to make their first couple of sales, you know, a lot of times they're, they're, they're selling futures is what they're doing. And, and they often, they'll talk about, they'll promise things on their roadmap and future upgrades and things like that. Um, and, and they do that, and it can have obviously some significant impacts on, on revenue. And again, we'll say it's $10,000, and because it's a new company, we're going to assume it's a new company, uh, there, is no, there is no VSOE, particularly on the roadmap, because they just have no idea what that's about. So, so the impact of this would be, um, you know, under the current standard, more often than not, if you've got uh, these these things on the roadmap, you you obviously you don't have a specific history, you don't have VSOE, you don't know exactly what they're going to cost to develop or how much you would sell them for because they are essentially vaporware at this point. So under the current rules, you generally end up deferring all the revenue until the last deliverable, last required deliverable is delivered. Um, just for sake of argument here, we're going to assume that that's 18 months out. Um, so under the current standard, you've got this whole this whole piece being being deferred out quite a bit. Uh, 606 um, has a, has a very different different take on that. Um, under 606, you actually need to evaluate each of the the four deliverables per the contract, the original license plus each of the three upgrades, and, and evaluate them each separately. And you might end up with, you may well end up with something uh, that looks kind of like we have on the screen here, where you've got the license revenue is, is $3,000. Um, and then the future upgrades each need to be evaluated as to what they would, how they would, how much revenue would you associate with each of those. Um, there's a couple different ways you could do that uh, per the standard. Uh, you might do it based on estimated selling price. Uh, it might be based on uh, the cost to develop those upgrades. Um, how, based on how many hours, perhaps, um, would, would be the other way you might do it. So there's different ways you can do that, but essentially what you end up with is a very different revenue recognition uh, timeline. Uh, and when you're talking to invest, and those particularly be more VC type environment, because these tend to be new companies, VCs, private equity groups, uh, angel investors type. Uh, but it obviously comes with a very, very different different scenario that we need to make sure that you understand up front and that you're able to explain to your potential investors up front as to what these things might look like. And this is when we talk about getting involved early. Um, if you're sitting here now doing this, uh, you could be very well into, or, or very shortly, you could be very well into uh, 
18 or 19 and still have deliverables sitting out there that you're going to need to restate um, based on 605 and 606. And it could, you know, if you're forecasting how your numbers are going to look out in a couple of years, which you probably are, um, it could look very, very different on, on how on how you imp on how those numbers mm -hmm. how those numbers are going to play out for your investors. And, and I think there's a couple of interesting points here. I mean, I think to John's point again, the the overall dollars don't change, but one of the key underlying themes of this uh, of this new uh, ASC 606 is the timing of the revenue recognition changes, which is which is extremely important. And one of the other things that I actually find extremely interesting is uh, for the longest time, GAP never gave you money uh, and always took it away or deferred it. Um, in, in a lot of the scenarios that we're going to look at, as and this is probably a great example, uh, under the current standards, the 10000 was deferred until the delivery uh, after 18 months. But if you look at the, the recognition under 606, you'll see that there's an acceleration of revenue recognition, which is one thing that I actually really find uh, interesting is, is how now the pendulum has swung again, and it says, no, we'll allow you to recognize revenue earlier in the process. Uh, and that's that's another kind of general theme as I'm reading through the standard that, that I've found is, is more often than not, um, the new standard will allow you to recognize the revenue earlier. Now, in some cases, it will require more estimates uh, that are involved in order to do so. But um, that is certainly something that's interesting. And so it, to John's point, as you guys as, uh, are planning and, and forecasting revenues, what your forecasts look like now could be very different from what it would look like under the new standard. And certainly, again, something to, to consider and think about as you're planning for transition. Yeah, something you might want to comment on, Ricardo, as, as, as the auditor uh, side of this is, you know, so if you're coming in to audit this company, what kind of evidence are you going to be looking for to come up with these numbers? Um, I mean, I'm, I might be the, C I'm on the CFO side by my background. Yes. Yeah, so I might come up with these numbers, but you know, now I have to justify them to you as the auditors yeah. as to what these, why these numbers are, why is deliverable number one, $2,500. Yeah. Again, and, and, and that's a great point because I think what's going to need to happen is the fact that uh, conversations are going to need to be had with the auditors early on in the process. One, to ensure that the, the transition to the new standard is, is correct in terms of how it's being adopted and applied to the company. But then also, what sort of audit evidence are you going to provide to the auditor to get them comfortable? So in, in, in some cases, it's fairly easy uh, coming up with, you know, kind of the estimates of the, um, of the transaction price, uh, somewhat similar to what we, you would provide in, in documentation supporting best estimated selling price. Uh, in other cases where there's estimates, that's going to be a lot harder to, to justify and to support. So... Again, working with your auditors up front, I think, is extremely important to make sure that they're comfortable as well with the evidence that you plan on providing to support the recognition of revenue. The, the, third, the third example I want, we want to look at um, essentially deals with uh, performance-based uh, revenue. In this example, we're going to assume that there's a vendor that has a, has a contract with a customer to build an asset and it could for $100,000. It could be a piece of equipment. It could be a piece of software. Uh, you know, it could be, could be a lot of different things. But the contract, the key to this is the contract contains a performance bonus, uh, $50,000 performance bonus to essentially incent the, the vendor to get the project done on time and on cost. And, and for that incentive, the contract says with a 10% decrease, decrease in the bonus amount for every week uh, the completion gets extended beyond the original agreed upon date. Um, so, you know, not terribly unusual to have performance bonuses like this tied to contracts, um, but the accounting for it ends up being, being very different. Um, you know, it, it, we're going to assume here for, for simplicity's sake that the entity has uh, experience with similar contracts. So this isn't a, kind of a first time they're doing this, but they've done this fairly frequently and they have some pretty good ability to forecast when they think the work is going to be done. And you can see some of management's estimated probabilities here. You know, they're pretty sure they're going to get it done. You know, by 60% sure they're going to get it done one week late. Uh, you know, 30% on time. Um, you know, 10% two weeks late. So they're going to be pretty close, but they think they're probably going to be a little bit late. So the question is, how do you, how do you account for a performance bonus like, like this? Uh, and again, the, the the rules come up very differently as to as to how that's gonna as to what you're gonna do. 
under the under the current standard 605, um, essentially you'd say, all right, so I'm going to wait and see how I do. And when that when I deliver the contract, I'm going to recognize or the, I'm going to recognize the bonus. And this obviously only deals with the bonus side of the, the equation. And so on date of delivery, I'm going to recognize forty five thousand dollars of revenue. And the reason it's forty five thousand dollars is because it's we're going to assume that they're a week late. And that, that's what it's going to be. Um, however, under the, under the new rules, uh, management is, you know, if they've, if they've got some good experience, they're going to estimate the probability of, of when they're going to deliver the contract. And on the date of the sale, they're going to recognize that revenue. Um, and since we're assuming that, since they think they're probably going to be a week late, they're going to take a 10% haircut on the $50,000 bonus, and they're going to recognize $45,000 of revenue on the date of sale. Now, of course, on the you will of course true it up to actual. Should the uh, should you be on time, you'd recognize the additional five thousand dollars. If you're if you're later, you would actually take a uh, a reduction of revenue and accounts receivable uh, for for that for that decrease. Where on the obviously under the six hundred five rules, you would know the answer because you're waiting. Um, but again, this is a scenario where uh, the timing of the revenue becomes very different, and the bonus is recognized up front. And again, I know, I know we want to keep coming back to this because I think it's very important. Um, you know, the, the way you the way you forecast your revenue, uh, the way you report to management, and management's understanding of what of what the impacts are is going to be very very different. Um, so yeah, so this is an example, as Ricardo said, um, in the old under the current standard, it's usually they, they take revenue away or delay revenue. Uh, the new standard, a lot of times, you're going to recognize revenue earlier in the process. Um, and this is this is a, this is a good a good example of that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is again, uh, it, if you look at the 606 side versus 605, you'll see there's an acceleration of the revenue recognition. Whereas uh, prior to that, you you would or under the current guidance, you would actually wait until the date of delivery to to recognize the revenue in the in the AR. So now, again, there's more of an estimate, which if we if I put my auditor hat on. Um, you know, we, we start to question and pull coals. Okay, how did you come up with the 60%, 30%, 10%? Uh, what sort of information or inputs uh, and assumptions were used to, to determine that? And what sort of history do you have to prove that? So I think there's going to be an incremental amount of effort placed on these types of scenarios between auditor and company in order to understand and gain comfort over the recognition of the $45,000 in this case. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, that means it's going to put more pressure on on management to have the documentation, the records, mm -hmm. the history, um, and to keep good documentation on their contracts. Make sure they've got the systems and processes in place to recognize uh, how much they recognize on the contract, when they recognize it, and and and, and why they come up with in this case uh, the sixty percent, ten percent discount. Uh, you can't just you know kind of wait and see what happens. So there's going to be a lot more pressure. Uh, on systems and processes as well to make sure you've got you've got that kind of that history. Uh, the fourth the fourth example we want to look at here um, again we're going to so we're going to assume that they, a vendor sells a twenty thousand dollar product and the customer has, the customer has a return right um, if it doesn't if the customer if the product doesn't meet the customer's needs uh, the customer can return it so on on, on the current Standards. If if the, if the customer has, if the excuse me, if the vendor has good history, as in, as you typically see in the retail world uh, of returns, you know you can just take it. You can just take a discount on the return, or, or on, on the revenue for the amount of expected returns if you've got that that kind of a history. Um, however, for many of the you know many technology companies, uh, many newer companies, uh, many companies don't have very high volumes of transactions. Um, you know, building up that history and having that history to, to work from uh, can, can be very difficult or just take a lot of time. Um, so in the meantime, you end up with, uh, you can end up with a significant deferral of revenue. But again, under the, under the new standard, they take a, they take a very different, different view of it. Um, you know, in this case, we're going to assume management can estimate um, that sales are not, or excuse me, returns um, do not ex are not expected to be more than 10% of sales. Um, and that can be based on some limited history, uh, you know, not, not to the degree you would have to do the discount 
uh, for, for, for returns today, um, but just more management has a lot more flexibility to estimate that based on, on various information they have, customers, uh, their own tests, uh, what, you know, a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, so under the current standard, essentially if you don't have, if you don't have that history and the customer has a return right, uh, you essentially end up needing to defer the revenue. Uh, so as you can see on the right side of the screen, you end up in this case with the $20,000 sitting in deferred revenue uh, for a year uh, until, the, until the return right expires. Um, and if you assume you get a 10% return, uh, in this simple example, you'd recognize $18,000 of revenue um, on, on delivery of the various products, and you'd have you know eight, uh, and a $2,000 refund based on based on the original payments. Uh, the new standard takes again takes a very different view of that, and it it essentially lets you recognize the $18,000 of expected revenue on um, at at the initial at the initial sale. Um, and that actually says date of delivery at the bottom, but actually I guess that really should be a, a date that the return right expires rather than, rather than a date of delivery. Um, but the date of the original delivery is you recognize $18,000 of revenue, and then you have a liability for the, for the expected returns, in this case it's 10% of $2,000. If when that right of return expires, um, you would obviously you would adjust that to what actually actually happens, and again, you could either have recognize more revenue, or you could actually take a reduction in revenue at that time. Um, but you don't have to wait until the, wait for the full year until that expires uh, in order to in order to make that adjustment. I guess I should make the point here that obviously you wouldn't rather like to stand it today. If it, if it becomes obvious that returns will exceed ten percent, you would begin to take that hit right away. You wouldn't wait until the very end. You still have that um, requirement to take to take the uh, take the expense or the reduction in revenue if and if and when it becomes apparent that that's that that's becomes probable that that's going to happen. You need to take that. You take it. You may not wait until the very end. Um, but again you've got the scenario where you're delaying delaying the you're not delaying the revenue recognition, you're recognizing it up front where the current standard requires a much bigger delay of the, of the revenue. So with that, we're going to go to our third polling question. Thank you, John. So fortunately, we have got true and false here. So we actually had four examples, not three examples. But in the examples that were just shared, the answer or the question here is the amount of revenue recognized, was that changed or unchanged? So true or false? Um, in the examples just shared, the amount of revenue recognized changed. So your choice is true, false, or not sure. And we're going to give uh, folks a couple of minutes here to weigh in. There were a lot of details there, so it's, it's understandable if it takes a moment to, to figure that out. Okay, it looks like we've got the, the majority of our group has, has weighed in, so we're going to go ahead and close that poll. So, John, were they right or were they wrong here? So, the Let's majority... The majority said false. So, so, so the answer is the answer is false. The amount of revenue did not change, um, and maybe we could have written that a little clearer. But having it was written as a bit of a trick question. But uh, that is an important point, as we said up front. The total amount of revenue does not change. The timing of it can change substantially, um, but the total amount does not does not change. And that, that's obviously very intentional because. Your accounting shouldn't, at the end of the day, doesn't change the amount of revenue to be recognized. And, and I think that, that was important, certainly, for, um, for that piece to remember is, is, and as you're budgeting and forecasting, again, to John's point, you're not going to be uh, focused on uh, the fact that the revenue will change. Again, it's more of the timing of that revenue is going to change. So, you know, if you had to recognize 100000 you'll still recognize 100000 but it just might be a little bit earlier actually in the process. So certainly something to keep in mind as you're planning and forecasting. All right, so AICPA actually um, issued a roadmap which uh, I thought was, was uh, very helpful uh, in the consideration process and, and a lot of this was actually built off of the um, 
the recommended timeline back when the initial standard was was being looked at. However, it still uh, applies to to today's um, timeline. So the first item is um, assign an individual uh, in the company staff uh, or form a task force to become experts. Again, the the standard eliminates transaction and industry specific RevRec guidance, uh, but there is still some some subtle nuances that that need to be evaluated and considered. And the more that you understand the process, not only from the finance accounting perspective, but also from the um, the other areas, affected areas, which John will talk about here in a little bit, forming a task force of kind of the key stakeholders is going to be important. Uh, the second item would be to evaluate the changes from current GAAP to the new revenue recognition standard and, and evaluate its impact. So again, work with your auditor if you have one to ensure that the approach uh, makes sense and that it's documented and that you have uh, supportable audit evidence to provide to the auditors. Um, here, I'll just share some of the interesting facts that, that I found as I was reading through the standard. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was that um, approval of a contract can be made orally, uh, including contract modifications, which is something that uh, for us here in the U.S. hadn't historically dealt with before. And, and, and obviously, there's going to be some legal ramification as to what constitutes an oral, oral arrangement, but certainly something to keep in mind as well. And again, there is the concept of the customary business practice. For companies, so it isn't something that you would you would um, you know if it's a one-off, it doesn't wouldn't necessarily constitute um, um, a part of a contract. Uh, there's also the concept of an implied contract as well. Uh, so if you kind of think of the implied PCS uh, from the software world, um, having that kind of implied contract for for a certain performance obligation is something also to keep in mind. Contract modifications may exist even though the scope or price or both are in dispute. Um, so if the price is in dispute or not approved, the entity would estimate the change to the price. And again, there's that concept. I think two things to remember here. If there's two takeaways from this, it's timing and estimates, uh, which are two key key concepts here from the, uh, from the new standard. Um, there's a time value of money concept, which will also impact um, kind of interest expense or interest income uh, in the statement of comprehensive income uh, according to the standard, too. There's a concept of a contract asset, which is um, a contract asset versus a receivable. And the difference really being the contract asset is conditional on something other than the passage of time versus a receivable, which is unconditional. So two kind of distinct um, items. So if you kind of think about the uh, that, that unbilled AR that we typically see with some companies might may now become a contract asset uh, as opposed to a receivable. And then, of course, uh, recording an asset for incremental costs. A uh, great example is sales commission. So that was um, something that a lot of companies hadn't historically done, but now is something that's going to be required as part of the of, of the standard. And then certainly in, in the software space, uh, there's no longer the requirement to have DSOE for your undelivered items. Um, so that, that's something that, that is huge. If you didn't have VSOE, you'd have to defer until you actually had VSOE or until you delivered uh, all of the items. So under the new standard, though, you no longer have this concept of VSOE. So every, every item or every performance obligation will be allocated a portion of that uh, transaction price. So just, yeah, you made an one of the interesting points I want to just kind of come back to for a moment because we see this in a, with a lot of our clients we work with. Is, is the whole concept of, of company practice. Um, and that can cause a lot of problems. And it's, it's true in the, under the current standard, too, but I just want to kind of come back to that because it comes up a lot. Um, you know, many companies will, you know, they're, they're being nice to their customers. They're being very, being uh, uh, responsive to their customers. And it might be, the, clearly might be the right business decision uh, to you know, do things like accept the returns, exchanges, um, you know, provide customers with upgrades, uh, or updates to software and products, things like that, which is which I say may be the right business uh, decision for the company, uh, but can have significant impacts on revenue recognition. Even if it's even if it's not in the contract, and the customer's like no, contract or the vendor's not contractually obligated to provide that. Uh, a lot of companies do that kind of as routine, you know, customer service, and that can have you know we need to evaluate those now. You really need to look at those and say what is our company practice and. And you may now need to account for those 
uh, there's gonna be a lot more focus on accounting for those as separate separate elements of the contract and evaluating them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you may not be thinking about that right now because well it's not in the contract, but if that's what you're doing, uh, that that can that can cause some significant issues that you just need to be aware of and ha make sure you account for those accordingly. Yeah, it's a good point. All right, uh, step three, determine how you uh, plan on adopting either the retrospective or the modified retrospective approach. Determine the changes to the IT systems. John kind of talked about this uh, a little bit, which uh, in which case, you know, IT systems have typically been set up for the current guidance, and uh, they may, there may need to be some modifications for uh, changes to the revenue recognition process and, and how it's actually recognized and timing of it. And actually, one of the interesting things that, that I saw, and I'm sure you did too, John, when we were uh, at our conference was about half the group was um, kind of finance accounting professionals. The other half were IT folks. Um, and certainly something I found interesting. I think that's really true. The, the IT impacts, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes, uh, but the IT impacts are going to be very substantial for a lot of companies. Uh, because if you've got, a, if you've got a, any type of revenue system you're using now, um, it has to be changed. It has to be updated. And that's going to be, you know, you don't have a lot of time to do that because companies are already, uh, you know, when you're doing the, the implementation uh, of, of the new standard, you know, you're going to need to retrospectively or, or in, in one way or another, whether you use the retrospective or modified retrospective, you need to kind of really track contracts two ways. And that's going to be a real challenge mm -hmm. and for, for on, on the IT side. And then step five is determine what interim disclosures are, are going to need to be made uh, before the RevRec standard is, is effective. So this applies more to our SEC public company um, uh, companies uh, and actually something that the SEC has been focused on in their uh, conference that they had in December of last year. And they actually made a point to discuss uh, interim disclosures and uh, how they thought it was worthwhile to include a company's plan in the 10 Q's on how they were progressing towards a transition to the new standard. And then of course develop a, a project plan and, and make sure that it's an evolving project plan for, for implementation. It, it should be a living, uh, living and breathing plan until uh, the actual transition takes place. And then certainly educate key stakeholders. I think that's that's extremely important because although you know you all you all are participating on this, uh, there's a lot of people who are stakeholders in the process who aren't participating or don't have an understanding of how the revenue recognition might change. So again, the key concept to remind them is that there's going to be uh, changes in the timing of revenue recognition as well as changes to um, estimates uh, involved in the revenue recognition. So educating those key stakeholders is really important. Great. So, John, we're moving on to you. Okay. So, this is this is a bit of a wrap-up from kind of what we've been talking about. Um, you know, kind of the ripple effect of some of the changes, um, because we do want to really kind of emphasize this. Of, of how this, of some of the areas where this, these revenue recognition standards uh, will impact the company, uh, I suspect most of the folks on this on this webinar are uh, finance people, um, whether, whether it be controllers, directors of revenue, CFOs, whatever. Uh, but the, the key point to remember here is this goes well beyond finance and the impacts. Uh, we've talked a little bit about analysts and investor expectations. Uh, keep in mind that you know 606 can cause in the in the beginning when you first implement it, it could actually cause a, a substantial decrease in revenue in those first periods, because you've got contracts where you've got a lot of it. You know you have deferred revenue that you expect to re recognize out into the future, um, that in, that will now have been recognized in prior periods. You may end up pulling back revenue uh, into prior periods. For instance, if you're a private company recognizing or, excuse me, adopting the standards in 2019, uh, if some of that revenue under the new standard would have, would have been recognized in 2018 or even 2017, uh, you need to pull that back into those periods as part of the uh, implementation of, of the, the standard. And your first quarter or even first half of 19 revenue could take a substantial decrease from what you were expecting. And you need to really plan for that and understand that 
and make sure your your investors and anal your investors understand that and begin to really educate the street if you're a public company as to what some of these impacts might be. I think we're going to see a lot more of that here uh, coming up pretty quickly when you get into the into the uh, the middle of 17 for public companies uh, in terms of their their street and what they're what they're telling the street for uh, expectations and guidance. Uh, but for all companies, in terms of investors, they need to begin to understand that. Obviously, it's going to impact the sales and the sales team, especially if your commission plan is based is in any way tied to revenue recognition. Uh, you need to rethink of how that's going to how are you going to do that. Um, you know, tied to that is your, your your contracts and your sales contracts. Also, you may want to think about how you're going to change those contracts. Uh, to, to for these changes, if you're if you're if you're delivering more things, more more deliverables up front, you may want to be a lot more specific as to what those are, and how and how you deal with those contract contractually. Um, as we talked about earlier, the you know, if and when available uh, may not be the right standard anymore. You, you may want to start really thinking about how those how you define that. Uh, we've talked about the forecasting and the impact of that. Um, the IT systems. Uh, order management, billing, credit, cost accounting. Um, all of these things need to be changed. This is why when we went at the, as uh, Ricardo said, at the seminar we were talking at, the conference we were speaking at, uh, a lot of the folks there were IT folks. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the cost accounting side, but you know the, the costs need to be changed and recognized along with the revenue. Um, the matching principle still exists. Things like commissions, where now we're generally uh, not tied directly to revenue, now need to be tied to revenue brought at the cost of sales. So there's a significant number of impacts across across the company in a lot of different departments. To me, the analyst expectation is a big one too, because I think that the um, again, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we we all look for comparability within an industry, and I think that with the new standard, you might have. Uh, the same company in the same industry, but taking two different approaches to the recognition of revenue, which again goes against comparability. And so I think educating analysts and investors, because analysts are going to have a fit, I think, with this, you know, trying to draw comparability and how do I value this company versus that company. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big issue at, at the outset. So I think it's important to educate that group um, about the changes and, and how they affect your company, why your company might have taken a different position than another similar company in the industry. So, so very important again to understand the the subtle nuances and why you might have taken a different approach. Again, principles based uh, standard. So theoretically, you could be right uh, and still be in the same industry. And one person took one position, and another person took another position, um, and both have legs to support their positions. And so both are theoretically right. Um, so, so I think that's going to be important is just to understand how, how the standard affects your company in particular and then how, my, how that might be different than some of your other competitors. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's very true. I think that's going to be the really interesting uh, part of how this all plays out over the next two years um, is, that, is how the street reacts to this and how analysts react to this. And as I said earlier, the SEC, because they, they hate things being different. It drives yeah. them crazy. Um, so, so real quickly, how do, as, as we're getting you to the end here, how, how can Armanino – uh, help and what what do we do uh, with our clients? Um, you know, so one of the first things we do is is really help uh, clients and the companies we work with are really by doing a side by side comparison of the of your contracts, your your business history, your revenue recognition under the old rules and the new rules, and that that is really the that assessment is really the key first step. Um, and even even the uh, the ICPA guidelines. Um, outline those. Those is really the first step. Is to really do that comparison. Make sure that you you understand how that will impact your company, so that you can really go to the executive team, to the board of directors, and if and if you're a public company, to you know begin to go to the street and really educate them on what those changes are going to be. Uh, but if you, particularly if you're a private company, you know you really want to make sure that the your investors, whether it be angels, VCs, private equities, whatever they are. Uh, really understand these changes and, and how they're how they're going to impact and the numbers they're going to be seeing and what that's going to look like. Um, it'll it'll definitely as as a CFO or you know finance professional in the company, your life will be a much much easier if you've taken the time to educate them up front than if you get to that first quarter those first quarter numbers after you've adopted and all of a sudden your numbers are different. And you're trying to explain why uh, why the numbers are still right. They're just different. And if if the uh, investors don't understand that, you're going to have a very long hard board meeting, mm -hmm. that, first, that first one out of the gate. 
Um, so this is essentially what we really what we really try to address. It's really kind of that gap analysis, uh, potential exposure for the company, um, wh where the new standards and what needs to change, um, how that impacts the metrics from, from budgeting and forecasting, uh, potential changes to contract terms, um, and high level dates to really begin to put that that plan together to make sure you're you're, you're ready. Um, you know, it seems like you know 2019 for a private company seems like it's way out there and you got lots of time. Uh, but but time is not your friend in this scenario because the changes could be very substantial, um, and you want to have time to really make sure you you work through all of the issues, um, not just your customer contracts, uh, because you know a contract in 17 could very well still be in, in force in 19, um, and the revenue could change on that. Uh, but, but as we talked about, your systems, your processes, your uh, the impacts on your sales folks, and what that all means. Um, and it's so, so it's really kind of addressing the whole people, process, technologies to really make sure you're you're ready to implement the implement the change and have a clear roadmap uh, and timeline to do that to do the implementation, do all the changes. Uh, you don't want to get jammed at the last minute trying to make make these changes in a, in a rush. At, 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 you know, in the, you know in the last quarter before you have to go live. It's going to be a very you know, a lot of sleepless long sleepless nights if that's the case. And with that, it brings us to our fourth and final polling question. So we'll do the polling question, and a couple of you have sent in questions. We'll answer um, as many as we have time for, and then we will email you responses if we don't get to your question today. So which departments will be most affected by the new revenue recognition rules? Is it A, accounting, IT, sales, investor relations, or all of the above? So... Um, Please give us your choice on who's going to be having the biggest impact from the new revenue recognition rules. And this is not, I don't think, so much of a trick question today. But all right, let's go ahead and close that poll. Brian, thank you. And the respondents have said all of the above for the majority. All of the above is, it was, is really the right answer. I think we had 88% uh, said uh, all of the above. And that was, I think, it's one of the one of the key points we wanted to make sure we, we were clear about is that it really does it impacts the whole company. It's very easy to think of this as a uh, well, it's a change in accounting, and you know the accountants have to deal with it. Uh, but but the, imp the implications are, are far and wide. So you want you want to make sure you're beginning to educate um, the entire company as to what these changes might mean. Great. Okay, so. So, so I'm going to just begin to, begin to wrap up uh, before we get to before we get to the questions. Uh, we've looked at some some prototypes, so some some examples of revenue recognition gaps, and begun to really identify some of the organizations. Uh, the key areas where where it's impacted some of the regulations, departmental impacts. Um, so hopefully hopefully it's given you a bit of, a little better understanding of, of how of how the uh, this new standard will impact the company, and and we can. Uh, and begin to educate your the rest of your team and company, your executives, your board, as to what as to what that might mean. Um, okay, great. So, um, first question from the audience is: When referring to public companies, are you referring to just USA public companies that are affected by these new revenue recognition rules? Well, the the standard is a converged standard, so it does apply to both. Uh, uh, I guess it's an international standard now because it follows. Somewhat similarly between U.S. GAAP now and IFRS, there are some subtle differences, but uh, yes, when we, we talk about public companies, we're, we're just talking about U.S. public companies, uh, although the standards are going to affect um, international companies similarly. Yeah, that's, that's an important point. For those, for those of you on the webinar who are, who are not with U.S. US companies, U.S.-based companies, um, the, the international standards are changing as well, very, very similar to the U.S. standards, so it is, it, we're primarily talking about U.S. GAAP and our examples are very specific to U.S. GAAP, but the but the impact is for all international companies as well. So for those of you who are with international companies or non-U.S. companies, yeah, it, it, you will be changed. You will have impacts as well. Okay, and uh, we did get a few more questions, but we are running out of time here. So if um, we will have our pan, uh, present presenters answer your questions, but I do want to answer one question that came in is this webinar was recorded and you will receive an email within the next two days with a link to the recording and also the set of slides. 
So please look for that in your email box. And also those of you who sent in questions, we will make sure we get those responses out to you. And we thank all of you for calling in. So thanks for joining Armanino today.